begin with, would you mind uh, telling me your name and just introduce yourself however you'd like to? Okay, my name's Al Clark. Okay, <laughs> good intro. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, tell, me, um, tell me about your involvement with the creeks and what people should know about the creeks. And I, I'm interested in the storm drain, oh, the, the channelization of them and why one's better than the other and uh, <laughs> perhaps about when things happen, if you know offhand. Okay. Well, I know that the, um, in, after the uh, floods of 1969, we had big rains, you know, it was one of those rains for 40 days and 40 nights kind of events with a lot of flooding and um, there, I guess there were some issues and so the Army Corps of Engineers came in and, and channelized some of the creeks, but apparently a deal was made to keep Carpenter Creek unchannelized. This is what uh, uh, Ernie Wilbrandt told me that that um, they they you know were determined to keep Carpenteria um, free of channelization. Um, Why? To keep it natural. Um, you know, it's the, the the creek becomes a, a a kind of ecosystem. You know, you have you have a cycle of life happening there in the creek. It's the, the drawn to water and the habitat. When you have when you have a concrete creek, birds will try to go there and 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 drink water and such, but they can't really live there. There's no there's no plants. Um, there's no trees. There's no shelter. There's no shade. So. Um, and there's no there's no recharge of the water. So this this is a very important issue now. Is that we we like to recharge as much runoff or waste water as we can, rather than let it go to the ocean. And well, when you have a channelized creek, it, it's all going to the ocean. When you have a creek, you, you're you're allowing for a lot of recharge to occur. Anyway, the creek committee um, was started really by some citizens, and and it was kind of typical of a lot of citizens groups. Volunteerism is a, is a huge uh, component of, of what makes carpentry a special. A lot of people being involved in their government, in their community, and in in their future. And um, I think I wasn't really involved in it at first, but I, but I believe it was some citizens kind of seeing seeing a, a, an area where their government could have been more involved um, and wasn't. And what had happened was that there was a a development on a particular site located at the corner of uh, Arbel Verde and Carpentry Avenue, and the proposal was to um, have seven um, condos on a second story cantilevered out over the creek on top of some commercial units. Very large building on a creek with no, no respect to the setback or anything on the creek. And, and when was that about? That was in about 1990. Ni or yeah, about 1990-ish, maybe 91, um, and so so a group formed to try to lobby the government on behalf of of reducing the size of that project in order to protect the creek, because it was it was found that there were that there were some standards in in the municipal code for protecting the creek, but but the city was ignoring them or hadn't even looked at them. And uh, that was part of changing the government in 1990, um, was getting a little bit more, paying more attention to the law, basically. Um, so with respect to this particular project, yeah? Well, and so the, the group was created, the Carpentry Creeks Committee? Or? Carpentry Creeks Committee was created by Bob Hansen and a gentleman named Gilbert Moore. And uh, I joined it shortly after they began, maybe six months or something. And the development kind of spurred it. That's, yeah, the de development spurred it. And the development that we're talking about, actually that, that project went on for about 10 years. At one time, um, the city finally, they asked them to do an EIR of their project. They refused to do it, so they withdrew their project. At that point, we tried to buy it. Uh, the Creek Committee tried to buy it. Um, seeing this was the best way out of this dilemma for the developer, and but we were unable to meet the price, and so it was it was eventually developed. But but what happened was that the creek committee was formed, and we began um, going to the government and 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 trying to get different aspects of the creek um, protected, and. Um, 
that really it, it really turned out well because the government the city government realized that they they needed to play a larger role in the protection of creeks and watersheds and and they basically started doing everything that the creek committee had been doing um, and they they implemented a creeks preservation program so it's it's um, part of the city law now to do all the stuff that we were asking them to do and so that the, the role of the Creek Committee actually diminished and, and it hasn't disappeared, it's only functioning now as maybe you'd say a watchdog, making sure that the city is following its own laws. Uh, but basically it's kind of a success story. About when was the uh, Creek uh, Preservation Program started? That was in about 2004. As a, as a part of the general plan update. The, the general plan gets updated every 20 years, and um, that it's a very long process. That process started in, in 1997 and was only finalized in 2004. Uh, are you aware of the channelization of the creeks when that happened? So I'm, I'm covering any issues between 65. I believe some of them were channeled. Can you talk about that? I think, the, I think a lot of it happened in 1969 after the flooding. Um, what happened? Well, there was there were a lot a lot of the, uh, there had been a lot of development that was put in too close to the creek bank, and um, that often happens in this kind of climate where you have very dry spells and then you have some wet spells, and um, you know pe people per allow development to happen right very close to creek banks, and boom, all of a sudden there's flooding and you know it causes problems. And that's when uh, maybe Santa Monica and Franklin Creek. Were right, I believe so. I'm not really sure, you know, which ones, but I, I think that's right. Definitely Franklin. Um, Franklin Creek was channelized. Yeah, there. probably Santa Monica at that time also. I'm not really sure. So, society has kind of gone between liking natural creeks, thinking creeks need to be channelized, and now appreciating the. the what the natural creeks again is that has that been kind of a trend recently? I guess um, yeah. I think I think that that's a trend for a lot of a lot of natural areas. I mean, there was at one time in Carpentaria's history th there was a beach here, but nobody lived near the beach. The people were not not interested in the beach. Um, m my neighbor's husband is from an old old time family here, and and. Uh, I guess his grandmother bought a house on the beach and um, everybody thought she was absolutely crazy. Why would anybody want to live down there? You know, and so a hundred years later, boom, it's the most valuable property you can get. So, you know, things change like that. But I think there's a, people are getting more attuned to nature and um, uh, recreation in nature, but also the importance of, of the natural environment to our health. And also, um, uh, the reason uh, creeks should remain natural, can you go over them again, both aesthetic and practical? Well, uh, you know, I, I think what happened, going, going back to your, to your early question a little bit, what happened was is that um, people, didn't, people didn't really appreciate creeks, um, and so they built, they allowed development to occur too close to creeks and then when they flooded they realized yeah we need to have either a channel or a setback well you couldn't you couldn't have a setback for buildings that had already been built and and so that's why they did channelization um, I guess you could do a setback you just have to tear some houses out but um, anyway that was that was the option there was was to channelize creeks but you you know you have all this water um, rushing down the creek and none of it gets recharged into our important aquifers. That's basically our water supply. All that water is basically being flushed out to the ocean. So with a creek, you have a natural surface. You can the water penetrates, goes back down into the aquifer, and then we can pump it out and, and reuse it. Um, also, you have it. It's a you know there's a it's it's very very beautiful place aesthetically speaking with large trees and. Um, it's a good, it's a good little uh, classroom of nature for children. You know, we see classes 
uh, leave school and come down and look at the creek and um, you know the kids can see the polywogs and and things like that and then and then also the um, you know there's a lot of interest in getting the steelhead trout to come back up a creek and it's it's kind of a big deal but they can't they can't do it in a channelized creek um, so I, th I think that's I hear that's pretty close to happening in Carpinteria Creek, if, if it hasn't already, that steelhead will be able to go back and, and spawn again in the upstream. Uh, also, the water filters uh, the pollutants. Right. Can you say something to that effect? Well, that if, you, if you have some water, if you have some water runoff and it, it has pollutants in it, if, it, if those if those, uh, that water rushes straight out to sea, all those pollutants are going to wash out to sea. The, the um, water that penetrates the ground or, you know, through the permeable surface, the dirt rock surface, that acts as a, as a filter to remove uh, pollutants from, from the water that actually gets down to the aquifer so that when, you, when they pump that up and, and you drink it or it's, it's processed, the, those pollutants aren't there anymore. Now in a moment, I want you to talk about uh, the change in council direction in 90 that you helped with. But first, could you tell me about the Peace Corner? Uh, how did that come about? That came about in, um, in August of uh, 2002. There, there was a big uh, PR campaign by the um, White House to roll out a new war. And that was the Iraqi war. That's the the war with Iraq, and it was I I don't know if you remember or not, but they they realized in in about the third week in August is oops you don't ro roll out anything new in August because everybody's on vacation, and so they started that PR campaign again up in September, and um, but what was happening was that it it was as if uh, to to our minds that. Um, there were no alternative voices heard in the media. You know, you turn on any any channel practically, except for perhaps a Democracy Now! or something like that, and, and everybody was beating the drums for war. And, um, you know, if you, if you look back at, at uh, I don't want to get too much into this, but if you get back, if you go back to 9-11, um, you know, Iraq really wasn't part of that, so why are we going to war with Iraq? Um, you know, so people had a lot of questions about, you know, there's no nexus for, you know, why are we going to war there? And But there were no, and it, going back to that time, everybody was beating the drum for war. It's like, and so... Yeah, and the president then was? George W. Bush. And um, so we thought, we, you know, we, we need to tell people that that somebody else has a different opinion. Whether you agree with it or not, somebody else has a different opinion than... And here's our way to do it. We'll exercise our First Amendment rights by standing on the corner and waving a sign, and we'd be happy to talk to anybody who comes by and have a discussion about it. And what did some of the signs say, and what message were you trying to get out? Um, you know, it, it was not that coordinated of a, of a message. Um, any sign anybody wanted to bring was pretty much okay. I mean, some were very generic about you know, peace, um, or no war in Iraq, and and things like that. And were you were you out there the first time that people were out on that corner? Absolutely. You don't remember what weekend that was. Yeah, it was it was the uh, it was the first day of Avocado Festival, so it would have been October third or fourth of two thousand and two. Friday night. Huh? Friday night. And do you remember who else was out there at the beginning? Well, um, it was a kind of a brainchild, my wife, Kathleen Lord. And then she, she got Betty Songer and, and Ted Rhodes to, to help. And then we, we got some other people um, to come out. I can't remember everybody was there, who was there at first. I think it was relatively small at first, but they, the numbers quickly grew to 40 or 50 people um, a week prior to the beginning of the war, which was in, a, you know, March 17th, 2003, something like that. Um, and then 
the kitty corner for a while, a short while. What happened there? Well, I think there were people, people that that you know were kind of doing what we were doing, but you know they were reacting to us just as we reacted that there was no alternative voices in the media, and so they were saying, well, we're gonna uh, we're gonna be on another corner, and uh, you know we're gonna hold up a sign um, as to what we think, which was they thought the war was a good idea. And uh, which lasted the longest? Well, <laughs> well, they they kind of when when the president went to war. I mean, I, I remember right before the um, the Iraq war began, there were huge demonstrations actually all over the world. I mean, there were millions of people involved in demonstrations against the war, and the and the, and the president acknowledged those, but said, "No, we're going to go to war." And and so, I I think th those the people on the other corner. Uh, the pro-war people, like, uh, it's just my guess that they decide, okay, well, well, we won, there's no more need for us to be out here. Um, and so they left. And of course, if, we, if we're for peace, we probably have job security. I mean, we're kind of, we're going to be out there, you know, for quite a while. In fact, we have a lot of our original uh, members have passed on now. Um, um, well, now, I'm going to pause a second. Okay. Get into it. Okay. Yeah. So tell me about um, politics in CARP in the 80s and then how they changed in the 90s and your involvement. Well, I, I just came in 1986 and there's a little bit of a, a, a learning process. You know, you don't, you don't know everything right away, but I, I learned that there was a, you know, I, I would read the newspaper and I would see that um, there was a lot of development going on. And, and additionally, that the um, city was running in the red, and, and that they were they had to do some uh, generate some cash. And so what they did was they they took out some certificates of participation, um, and and we're still paying on that debt from those. But um, you know there just seemed to be some some questionable things going on and, and, and particularly with the development and the, and the interest of, of uh, that there was to, to develop the bluffs. You know, there was people, people may not know or they may forget, I mean, there, there was a proposal to build 350 condominiums and 200, uh, 200 room hotel you know, along with a lot of other amenities and, and um, you know, it's a huge amount of traffic. Um, and so there were a lot of people that, that were opposed to that. And uh, that was one of the central issues in the election of 1990 because the development of the bluffs was, was coming to a head at that time. Uh, there had been a lot of contentious hearings or very many, many people, uh, citizens that testified against it, um, but felt like they weren't being hear heard. The, the city in the spring of 1990 um, attempted to, to have a voter initiative, which was Measure M, to, to do a redevelopment district to raise more money. And um, there were a lot of people that, that studied up on redevelopment agencies and actually knew a lot about them. I was involved in a, in a debate that was held on Measure M at the, at the high school. And, um, Anyway, that was that was a very interesting campaign, and it was in that spring election, the uh, Measure M lost by 20 percent to 80 percent. So over, overwhelmingly, people um, didn't want the redevelopment agency, and so it's, uh, redevelopment is very complex, but it involves uh, taking tax increments uh, that are supposed to go to other places and keep them in the city. So some monies are supposed to go to the state, to the schools, da, da, da. and so the redevelopment's a way to keep more of the money in tax money in the city and to generate new tax money. The, the redevelopment agency was going to include all of Cart Maria, so that's why a lot of people were interested. Anyway, that kind of dovetailed because the council election was in the fall, and it was kind of like, oh, we won the Measure M, 80 to 20. The fall election is ours to lose, and so we we got some candidates going. Um, I was thinking about doing, but I didn't at that time. And uh, but I was her campaign manager, 
And um, that was Donna Jordan and Brad Stein and Mike Ledbetter, and they're all great candidates. And um, so they all won. And um, the election is on uh, approximately the first Tuesday in November, you know, November 5th, November 7th, whatever it is. And uh, there, there was another, the, the Donna and Brad and Mike won that election. And um, the bluffs had not been approved yet, but they, at the next regular city council meeting, because the new city council doesn't take seat until December, the old city council met one more time and they passed the, they passed the bluffs um, development at that time. So um, I remember the, um, the night of the swearing in is, um, you know, maybe the second Monday in December, something like that. Anyway, fairly early in December. Well, the very next day, the Coastal Commission was going to approve the bluffs plan. And that, that hearing was in San Diego, so we went to the we went to the Carpenter City Hall, and the, um, Mike and, and Brad and Donna were inducted into their or um, put on the on the city council. And immediately after that, Mike Ledbetter was sent. I mean, immediately, just he left right from the city council chambers to travel to San Diego. I believe Arturo Teo drove him down there, and he got up to testify at the Coastal Commission saying, yeah, we're the new government in, in Carpenter and we'd like to pull that plan back because there's a few more things we want to look at. And so that's, that's how the, um, the, the bluffs development was, was put on hold and, and also kind of the, that background behind the um, getting elected by the slate. But, it, you know, there was a lot of aspects to it. They wanted to uh, improve the city's uh, fiscal outlook. They wanted to provide more open government, more participation of citizens in government, more listening to citizens, make, make a government more user-friendly, if you will. And so I, hopefully that's, I mean, I think that's continued until now. At least we're trying to keep those things going. Was there some vote by the populace that approved Bluff's development? Not that you recall. I thought, no. Okay. I, I don't. There was a, there was one. There was Bluffs development of an oil refinery, that that um, that was one. I'm not sure the outcome because it wasn't built, but that was in the '60s. Okay. Uh, that's the only one I'm familiar with. Um, do you want to say anything more about the change in council direction in the '90s? No, I think that's that's about it. I mean, it kind of it, it it went back and forth for a while. I mean, the 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 slate was not always um, in the majority, um, you know, and uh, because Mike Ledbetter declined to run w once, and and so um, there was an imbalance, and then he came back, and you know, so it kind of went back and forth um, in that regard a little bit. But uh, you know, I think we've prevailed. Um, tell me about the Veneco issue, a recent issue. Well, how much time have you got? They, that's been going on since uh, 2003 when they first um, put in their application. And, um, you know, they, I guess they, they, there was an EIR conducted and it came up with 11 class one impacts. And so when you have a, an EIR in, in California, they, they um, look at all the uh, risks to the environment and to people um, that is posed by a project, and and if those can't be uh, mitigated or or resolved by by taking some action, then it's it's called Class One unavoidable impact, and you cannot approve um, a project that has one of those unless you pass what's called a statement of overriding considerations. Um, and and so there there was a CIR a draft EIR that had 11 uh, class one impacts and 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 the Veneco must have realized that the city council probably didn't have the will to pass the statement of overriding considerations and and their project would probably be denied because of these 11 class one impacts uh, so they they chose to do a uh, a voter initiative or and. Um, that was called Measure, gosh, I don't know, I can't remember, Measure P? I don't know, Measure M? Anyway, that, I mean, that's, that's fairly recent history. And, um, you know, that, that was another 
another example um, similar to this redevelopment thing where the people really came out and, and um, there was a huge public response and reaction to that, to that um, ballot initiative because basically what they had to do to eliminate those, all those impacts is to, is to rewrite our general plan. And the way you do that is you make an it used to say, you got to, for example, you got to protect the views from this place to that place. Um, they had to rewrite it to say, except this, their, and then they filled in their address. You know, so they had to go through all, all the whole general plan, find all the parts where their, their project was going to be a problem and rewrite the, the general plan to fit their project. And so a lot of people had a problem with that, not, not just oil development and, and that it's filthy dirty and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we ought to be looking at alternatives. But it was also, hey, this here's a corporation really taking control of our, of our government and, and taking the citizens out of the, out of the picture entirely. And so that's really, I can't really contrary. You know, there were parts in, a, in, in their ballot initiative would say, well, um, if we want to change any part of our project, we'll just come in and tell you what we're going to do. And be, you, 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 you don't give us a building, when there's no hearing for a building permit, we'll just bring in what we want to do and you have to give us a building permit. You know, there's no citizen hearing, no input, no mitigations, no nothing. You just do whatever you want to do. And so, I mean, people reacted pretty strong to that, as you, as you remember. I think the, the final vote on that was uh, 70 to 30 against. And so now, but they're, they're, they never withdrew their application during that whole part, so they still have their application open since 2003. Um, they thought that they would look at trying to uh, drill, sink their wells down in other places outside the city limits because they're doing slant drilling, they could drill over there and get oil over here. So um, apparently they never came to uh, a deal in that regard and so they're, they came back and they, they're revising their application and um, they're saying now that they, they only want to drill kind of underneath on the land right around uh, Venico not do any of this extended reach and so it only be on the land and, and the reason for that is in the general plan it, it's in their municipal code it, it's not permitted to have drilling offshore from onshore but drilling onshore is permitted and so they would just be drilling onshore um, and I believe that we were in the process of finalizing a completed application and they were about ready to go out and do a revised environmental impact report based on the new project when when the price of oil went in the tank and uh, Venico asked their um, that their uh, application be um, put on hold and I, I believe the city is currently looking at whether we should just actually terminate that application um, if there's not going to be any action on it. Because we're, you know, when you start a development application, there's a certain there's these clocks that start ticking. You know, you've got to take these steps by this time, by this time, by this time. You know, so if that's not going to happen, it's not um, doesn't really seem like a viable application if we're just going to miss these deadlines that we've established. Al, what, what do you think have been some of the big issues or news stories in the last 50 years since we've incorporated? <laughs> I don't know, I wasn't around the whole time. I think the incorporation probably was a pretty big deal. I would have liked to have been around then. I'll bet, I'll bet that was a, a pretty stirring debate. Hopefully you've talked to some of those people and you've, you've uh, captured a, a feeling of that time. But um, yeah, that would have been a pretty exciting time because I, you know, I think there's, there's, uh, there's always going to be those same forces at play. I'm sure the same forces that were at play back then are in play now, but just slightly different. Um, I think it's a little different. Now it's somewhat more business interests versus environmental interests. Then it was fiscal, whether it's going to cost us more money to incorporate. Yeah. Uh, but any other uh, issues? Uh, warrior mascot, uh, freeway widening? Well, the freeway widening is going on right now. Um, you know, the warrior mascot thing... Um, was was very interesting because I, I mean I didn't go to high school in in Carpenter. I went to high school in Santa Barbara, but um, you know I was I was um, 
um, surprised by by the depth of reaction to that um, issue. It was very interesting. Um, but the the which which side were you? The depth of reaction against changing the imagery. Right. I didn't think it was going to be. You know, a lot of people. Um, but you, you know, it's 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 a matter of identity, and you never know. Um, you know what people's identity are. You know until it gets threatened. Um, Although, I think, you know, to me, what was being proposed was not to change the name Warriors, just to eliminate some of the clip art you know, or, or some of the images that were um, offensive to the Native people. And, and so, um, you know, a lot of us didn't grow up in that culture. We can't understand it. But, so, but for me, I mean, you know, I think that we've, we, we need to sometimes pay attention, you know, if, if there's an easy way to um, alleviate or remove those, you know, the people felt offended that, you know, we should take a look at that. But, uh, you know, the freeway widening is going on now. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think there's it's Cartmere is really in the right right in the uh, in, in the as you as you as you uh, expand the freeway to ever have many lands you're ex lanes you're expanding to uh, during that construction it's always phased and so there's always a bottleneck somewhere where you always have a, a, a traffic problem and right now it's in Carpinteria once they've once they've they did the finish the Muscle Shoals to to Cart Maria the bottleneck is right here in Cart Maria so Every morning, uh, used to be only some mornings, but every morning now, Carpentry Avenue is the third lane on the freeway, and uh, so we're, you know, we're we're getting some traffic with it now. It's gonna. There's a, a lawsuit, uh, actually, a couple lawsuits um, against the uh, about the EIR for the freeway um, in Santa Barbara. One of them is fairly easy to resolve. It's just a, uh, I some people at Fernald Point that want to have a sound wall there. Um, the other one is a little bit more global and it's, it's I think it's looking more at um, you really haven't done enough to um, provide mass transit and, and, and you've created, this road is creating some other unintended problems and you haven't really studied that well enough. And you do have to remember that the, 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 the freeway funding the freeway's, uh, just one section of it's going to be, and that's the, the 10 miles in between Montecito and Cart Maria, that's going to be uh, about $500 million. Well, Measure A um, that we voted on, the voters voted on, is only going to provide $140 million of that. It. So it's not, it's not funded yet. And um, they're looking for grants to do that, but it's not funded. Uh, the, the plans are finalized. They're doing some engineering, but they've got this lawsuit and they don't have the money, so I'm not sure when that's, that's all going to be finished, but, but the, the title of the Measure A, what the voters voted on, a lot of people think, oh, Measure A is 101. Measure A is the widening of the freeway. Well, the title of that was Road Repair, Congestion Relief, and, and one other thing. So the, the most important thing was, was road repair. I mean, that's, that was the first part of the title of Measure A. And then congestion relief was the next part, and that's, that was uh, make a HOV lane on the freeway and, and provide rail. And, and, and so it's important that, those, that all those things be, be recognized. Unfortunately, the, the freeway is taking so much money that, that you know, there's thoughts that, oh, we had to take some of the money from road repair so we can put it in the freeway because the freeway doesn't have enough money. Well, then the roads um, are continue to be in bad shape, and, and a lot of roads are in bad shape in Carpinteria. Um, but anyway, we'll see what happens <laughs> on that one. Anything else you'd like to talk about? Any other issues? Um, well, I think that the, the plastic bags was um, a pretty big deal. I, I have some responsibility for that. We had... Uh, um, Explain what, what that... Okay, so the, the, the plastic bags issue, it has to do with the, the uh, polyethylene grocery bags, the throwaway grocery bags, the uh, disposable grocery bags that were being handed out like water. And, and in fact, 
anyway, we received a presentation and a, and a lady uh, from Santa Barbara named Kathy Kelly was brought down. No, that's not the right name. I can't remember her name. Anyway, she, this lady was brought down from, um, by, by Cart Maria Beautiful. And Cart Maria Beautiful was, their kind of nexus for that was, oh, there's all this litter everywhere. You know, it's these plastic bags. But, but this lady had a presentation that was much broader than that and, and showed a lot of health issues related to it, particularly health, health of the ocean. And um, I, the, 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 the thrust of that presentation was to get us to do some education. And I, it, to me, the presentation was so compelling, I was able to persuade the rest of the city council members that, yeah, we should do a ban on this. We should just ban plastic bags, as well as styrofoam food containers. Well, it turned out that the plastic, to, to ban plastic bags was a pretty tough nut to crack. And, but the, the styrofoam takeout was easy. That was kind of the low hanging fruit. So we did that right away. Uh, maybe within a month. The plastic bags took a, a number of years. The issue there was that the plastic bag industry uh, felt threatened and they didn't want cities to ban their plastic bags. Then they couldn't sell plastic bags, right? So they were suing everybody. Um, initially, well, I don't know about initially, but the big, the big uh, lawsuit was, well, if you if you eliminate plastic bags, then people are going to be using paper more. And so you need to do, if you're going to do that, you need to do an EIR and show what impact you're going to have on all these trees being cut down. And, um, you know, that's, well, yeah, okay, but which trees are being cut down? They don't, they don't cut down redwoods to make, to make paper bags. They have, they've got some tree farms somewhere. It's a, it's a renewable resource. And, um, but, but to get around that, I just put, well, let's just, let's just ban all bags altogether. But nobody had a stomach for that at the time. So we decided to go, we had to put that on hold, and, and um, we did. And, and Kathleen Reddington was elected, and one of the good things she did was um, she was always on that. She was always bringing that back. Let's get, let's get moving on the plastic bags. And, and uh, so but we, did, we did have to wait till the um, legal climate was cleared up, and there was, a, there was a case, a Manhattan Beach case, where the Supreme Court ruled, this is the Supreme Court of California, ruled that, a small city doesn't need to do this EIR. It would only be a big city where you'd have a big impact um, that you'd need to do this EIR. And so I think that the threshold was something like population 35,000 or something like that. And, and so that opened it up and we, you know, we were able to do the ban on plastic bags after that. About when was the styrofoam ban and then when was the plastic bag? Uh, boy, Larry, I'm gonna say that the Styrofoam ban was in 2007, mm -hmm. and that the plastic bag ban was mm, 2011 or 12. Okay. But don't quote me on that. Okay. Of course, you're doing that right now, but. Uh, I'm saying about <laughs> uh, Any other, so that was a good one. Any other issues come up that you'd like to? Um, you know, we had a, we, uh, when we were, there, there was this whole big uh, supermarket thing when, uh, I can't remember how that started, but uh, the, the owner of the shopping center was not going to renew Albertson's lease, or maybe it was that Albertson's didn't want their lease renewed, but I, I think they did. Maybe they were trying to cut a deal with Vaughn's. Anyway, Vaughn's was interested in, in moving into where Albertson's is. Um, I believe that's how it went because it was a larger store area, and uh, so eventually Albertsons came around and said, "Yeah, we want this," and they struck a deal. But they wanted to; they also wanted to expand into Rite Aid, and of course, Rite Aid left for whatever reason. Rite Aid was next door, and then Rite Aid moved over on Linden, a smaller space. Um, but so we, we were um, a little concerned about all this stuff and so we, we passed a big box ordinance. And um, so the upshot of that is when you've got a, 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 a 
commercial development that's over 20,000 square feet, I believe that's a, the threshold uh, square feet, that um, you know, you, you've got to meet certain conditions that this, this, this uh, ordinance kicks in. And, and there were, there were a, lot of, um, a lot of things behind that, uh, um, rationales for doing that. A lot of these, you know, I think uh, Costco wanted to come in here at one point the, the, when uh, Brad and Don and Mike were on the city council, and I think they wanted to go out uh, the east end of town, and, and basically the, the people said no, that we don't want a, one of these big box stores. And, and um, you know, I think there's, there's some, there are some problems, and, and uh, those, those kinds of stores tend to kill local businesses. And, um, you know, what, what happens is, is they, they, get a little, they get a little Hallmark card section in there, and so they start doing. They they get a pharmacy in there, and uh, you know, so they start competing with local businesses in all these different areas. It's kind of a Walmart model, and um, and and so and so it it's it's not only that, you know, th these local stores provide a business or an income for for people that live here, and they're your your friends and neighbors and all that community stuff. But also, there was a, a study that showed that for every dollar that's spent um, in a chain store, 13 cents of the dollar remains in the community. But in a, in a locally owned store, 47 cents of the, of the dollar um, is, is left in the, um, in the community. And so, we, you know, we do, we're, we're able to do some things with Albertsons, and obviously, it's doing that kind of thing. It's got, you know, it's, it's, it's. Uh, we were able to. Uh, th well, they did a lot of stuff voluntarily. They, they bought Shepherd Place Pharmacy, and 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 that's their pharmacy now. So, you know, that that kind of helped, and they promised to, to hire local people and 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 things like that. And so that's, I mean, that that helped, and. Um, Anyway, well, we still had that big box ordinance on the books, and 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 so um, we it didn't really it didn't um, we didn't need to use it with Albertsons, but but it's there um, for the future. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Probably there's probably a lot. <laughs> you want to mention Bellas Artes? Uh, Be Bellas Artes. Well, it's what what that is 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 um, you know we have a a. A large uh, community of immigrants in Carpinteria, and and they're not, they're not, you know, just like our local uh, people of of um, um, Central South American Mexican descent, but 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 recent immigrants that have come to to Carpinteria, and um, you know, there's some that live in people self-help housing projects and other places, obviously. And the, the idea, Bayes Artes is an arts education outreach program started by my wife, Kathleen Lord. And um, the idea behind it is to provide the students who are mostly children, but you know, we allow any age to attend, is to, is to develop a, a feeling of self esteem. And um, both through the creation of of, of an art piece that you know you conceive of it, you do it, and you complete it, and and you feel good about yourself. Um, and you know when people mess up, we try to encourage them. Oh no, here's how you can fix it, or you can always fix it. And you know you can. There's always a way. You don't need to be despondent and despair. You know what you can you can keep working on it. But um, there's been a lot of we had we we get grants for this project, and we've had to do a lot of research about these things. And the research shows that. Um, children who do art, all children who do art, um, get b better grades in school. They do better on tests, and they're more rounded in life. Uh, um, you know, so art art helps the brain uh, learn in all areas. And I think we're, you know, I I don't really understand um, all the school stuff that's going on now, but you know, I know this. Um, no child left behind testing stuff is I mean it, it's very heavily emphasizing that to the point where there's there's no room for art in the curriculum anymore and uh, 
So we're trying, we're, and also, it's, art's very important. Our research showed for um, minority students, it helps them uh, learn the language better, it helps them do better in school, and, and it helps them assimilate better in, in the broader culture. And um, so we've been doing that since about 2003 in Carpinteria. We go to the People's Self-Help Housing Projects and uh, we teach the kids art. We try to bring, uh, you know, the other part of self-esteem is having a sense of value or sense of worth of the culture that you come from. And a lot of these kids really don't know anything about the Mexican culture or not very much other than, you know, just growing up with their their parents. Um, you know, a lot of them will come from a small village right to the United States and, and, and they don't realize that, that Mexico actually has a very, very deep, very sophisticated um, artistic um, tradition. And so I think it helps them to see that. We try to uh, base all the, all the lessons in uh, Mexican art. My wife, Kathleen, studied art in Mexico, so she's very familiar with it. We have uh, some, we have a, a, a director, an instructional director, and two assistants or aides and these are all people that were in the program and now they've they've either graduated from high school or on their way and and they you know we've employed them to uh, to implement the, the program we also have some volunteers from the community that also help but I, this um, you know employing these people helps the other students see that you know they're become a role model as you know here's here's um, a road I could go you know we you know uh, art art can be some sort of career and um, anyway it just shows them uh, you know another another path nice. but uh, yeah it's been we, it's been very worthwhile for us to see these kids grow up did you want to say anything about the mix of Hispanic and Anglo cultures in the area uh, no not really okay and you have kind of through uh, the art <laughs> program which is yeah. fascinating yeah well, uh, thanks a lot, Al, and thanks for your good My community service. My pleasure, Larry. Thanks for yours also. Okay, well, <laughs> <pleasure too. laughs>